Silverberg, the director of the Center for Nonprofit Studies at Austin Community College, and welcome to Civil Society, where we explore issues affecting our communal well being through a nonprofit lens. We're a proud partner of ACC TV, but given COVID 19, we're going virtual for our fourth season. Our center is fully committed to being an anti racist organization, to accelerating our personal learning journeys, confronting our biases and blind spots and creating opportunities for others to do the same. This episode is part of our series on the Hispanic Latinx experience in Austin. In January, we'll explore the Asian Pacific Islander American and then the Native American indigenous people experiences in Austin. Our nine part series on the black experience in Austin is complete and can be viewed on our website. As we said in our public statement on racial equity, we're moved by a new sense of urgency to heighten our community's consciousness of institutional racism and systemic impediments to racial equity and to aggressively progress on the continuum to racial equity to fulfill America's promise for all of its inhabitants. You can access recordings of earlier episodes and register for future programs at nonprofitaustin.org slash civil society. I'm thrilled that my guest today is Nora DeHoya Comstock, an entrepreneur, business leader, and pioneer in using social media to build community for Latinas. He's also on the ACC Board of Trustees. He's the national international founder of Las Camadre para la America, my apologies for my Spanish. She served as the organization's leader since its inception and has built its membership to over 20,000 women in more than 100 cities, 28 states, and Puerto Rico. Nora's dedicated leadership to the, in the Austin community includes serving as chair and member of the Capital Area, Development, Work, Capital Area Workforce Development Board, now known as Workforce Solutions. He's also served on a number of nonprofit boards, including the Long Center for the Performing Arts, Economic Growth Business Incubator, Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce, and the Austin Museum of Art. He currently serves on the board of the Harbor Journal of Hispanic Policy in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Latin Literacy Now in Los Angeles. Nora formed Comstock uh, Connections, a business development constituency, consultancy in 1989. He's the first Latina selected for the Austin Women Commission's Women's Hall of Fame in 2012. She's been recognized for her extraordinary community service, especially her lifetime of commitment and achievements in serving the Hispanic community by numerous organizations, including the Hispanic Professional Women's Association, the Young Hispanic Professional Association of Austin, Conmi Madre, Texas Mexican American Chambers of Commerce, Greater Austin Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Hispanic Lifestyle Magazine, the Mexican American Cultural Center here in Austin, LULAC in 2018 by the Girl Scouts of Central Texas, the City Council, the Texas State Senate, many more, but most recently this year, she's been recognized with the Adela S. Vento Community Engagement and Service Award from LULAC. Nora believes that education, which translates into hope and opportunity, it is the single most important factor that can transform lives. On a personal note, I first met Nora in 1998 as a nervous networker when she was the chair of the Capital Area Workforce Board and I was seeking a new career and sought her counsel about workforce development and the idea I had of creating what is now the Center for Nonprofit Studies. She impressed me then and continues to impress me as a kind, gracious and generous woman who shares her knowledge, passion, and wisdom to help heal and make for a better world. She is also one of the most humble people that I know. Nora, welcome, and thank you very much uh, for the encouragement you gave me 20 years ago and for being willing to be part of this program and, of course, for your service as a ACC trustee. Thank you very much. I'm just, I'm honored and Thank you so much for asking me to join you. I, um, I look forward to sharing the answers to these challenging questions and I can explain why they were challenging as we go forward. Thank you. 
So I then have to say, having, having said that, Nora, I need to disclose that unlike the presidential and vice presidential debates, our guests get the questions in advance. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Nora. So before we launch into a bunch of other questions, topics, tell us about a little bit about uh, Nora Comstock, who was born in Raymondville, down uh, in, in, uh, in South Texas um, and uh, the Rio Grande Valley. Tell us a little about your childhood and what has brought you to be the kind of leader that you are today. You know, I definitely my upbringing and my life in Raymondville was very impactful in, in what I do today and what I've always done. Basically, I was born a happy-go-lucky child. I love to learn. I was curious. I love to laugh. And I did all those things on a regular basis. And I think part of the reason that I was able to do that is I wasn't hungry and I had a roof over my head. And bless all those people who can do those things without that. But I was very lucky. My family was low resourced, but there was so much love in our household. And the curiosity I had and the, my teachers the, the, in the early grades, they fed that curiosity. They helped me to learn and that kept me excited. And I, would, I was in every single sport. I did every single thing possible. My parents made it possible for me to do that. And then I would drop into bed dead tired and just sleep and wake up the next morning. I'd wake up talking, you know, what are we gonna learn today? What am I gonna do today? That was my childhood. I was successful because I had that energy, because I had that passion for life. And people like that. And that really is the reason for my success today, that I have passion, that I have love, and that I use those in my everyday life. I mean, that's that's pretty much it. Well, that's a simple secret. <laughs> so when you were growing up, um, there's a lot of prejudice a lot of injustice directed at Hispanics in South Texas. How did that affect your life, the life of your family, people around you? I'm not really sure I was aware of it. And, and, and it's, that's what I say. I, I kind of found the questions challenging because it is reflection. Going back and thinking, I'm not even sure that I remember that. Because to tell you the truth, the prejudice that I encountered was not so much from the white community but from the Brown community because I could speak English flawlessly. And so the kids in my classes, I didn't have the, the problem with them as it was with the adults. The adults were the ones who showed the prejudice, who put you in a different line, who did whatever it is they did. The kids at that age, they didn't show prejudice. They played with you. They did whatever. But the parents and, and at that time, some of the teachers were, were acting in ways that kind of caused you to stop and think, why are they doing that? But again, I was, I was a good student. I studied hard. I got good grades. And I was involved in every activity possible. And I saw discrimination against others. I saw kids being treated differently than I was being treated and the white community was being treated. And I tried to stand up for others when I saw injustice. But I think I personally did not notice it um, because I was elected to positions. I did lots of things. I was a popular kid. Again, going back to, you know, you're, you're doing everything. You're everywhere. You're using your hands a lot. And, you know, it, people, people like that. And, and I, was, I was fortunate, Barry. I was fortunate. But I did see the injustice. And when I left, I became so much more aware of it than when I was steeped in it. And another part of it goes back to the fact that I wasn't hungry and I wasn't homeless. And my parents did have, my dad went to the third grade, my mom to the eighth grade, but they both had a great value for education and insisted that I study. And they gave me all those opportunities to make the good grades. Well, that, that's a good segue to the question of education, which I know is one of your passions. Uh, Latinos are the largest and most rapidly growing minority group in the United States yet they have the lowest college completion rate. So what, what have you observed, seen, experienced as what are the challenges that a young Hispanic, male or female, faces 
um, often the first in their family to go to college, when they even think about college. Um, what, what, are those, what are some of those challenges so that others can understand and, and empathize with those challenges? Well, certainly early on, I didn't know anybody who went to college. I didn't know, I didn't know about college. I went to a private Catholic school in San Antonio because my aunt, who was the first person to go to college, became a nurse because a doctor in Raymondville saw her talent and her ability to, to learn, and he paid for her to go become a nurse in San Antonio. So she was the first, and then she, I moved to San Antonio because she invited me, and she said, I will send you to a private school in San Antonio, and um, if you'll help me with the kids in the afternoon. So that's pretty much what I did. And mm -hmm. But other than, and it, even in that school, we didn't talk about college. At least I don't remember talking about it. I know I took the test. I did whatever they said, but I didn't really know what college was about. And my friends who were going to college asked me, where are you going? And you know, I didn't know. And I didn't know how I was going to pay for it. No one ever talked about that kind of stuff. So they took me by the hand and I registered at Alamo uh, with today Alamo Colleges and I got my two-year degree at a community college and then um, went to the University of Texas to finish all the other degrees but if it wasn't for that help from my own colleagues um, I wouldn't have known about that and when I went there there were not others who looked like me again I always felt different because there were not other Latinos around me and it was a an it was not a new experience for me. That's a sad thing because in all my um, schooling up to that point, there hadn't been Latinos involved. And I became much more aware of that when I went to uh, the University of Texas at Austin where there were not many Latinos around me. The Latinos that were there were from South America, Central America, Mexico, but they were not Mexican American, which is what I am and what I grew up. That's the culture that I was missing. Um, and, and I didn't see us and I would look around and think, wow, there's no one who looks like me here. I don't understand why that is. It didn't keep me from doing what I needed to do, but I was very aware of it. What can I say? Taking your experience, what, what are some of the challenges that contemporary uh, Hispanic uh, adults, young adults face when they apply to the college? Or I even think, go to college? Um, frequently underprepared um, in the high schools, um, moving through the high school system, they're not necessarily prepared in writing and reading. And I know that that was one of the things I was not well prepared, but I got up to speed in a big hurry. And it was, again, you didn't see others around you who look like you. They weren't in your classrooms. You were pretty much alone and felt, felt incomplete. I, I wasn't sure that I could succeed because everybody who was around me a lot of the people around me were not Latino. And it made it uncomfortable at times. When you made mistakes, you felt, wow, is it tied to me? Um, am I not smart enough to do this? I really had to challenge the challenge of myself, of believing in myself. Of, even when I made good grades, it was like, wow, am I a fake? Did I really make that good grade? I mean, I really, I really struggled with that concept of self, I believe, in the classroom. And I believe that many of our students today still do. When you look around and you don't see anybody like you, you think, what am I doing here? Maybe I'm better off going to work. And I don't blame them for feeling that way and, and for dropping out. So you're a trustee of Austin Community College, my employer, um, or at least where I work. Um, and uh, just for the record, uh, Austin Community College is the ninth largest Hispanic enrolling two-year institution in the country, 25th among all two and four-year uh, schools. And Austin Community College is making a major, major effort to enroll and provide a hospitable environment where Hispanic students can learn and thrive. Can you talk a little bit about what ACC is doing um, and your role as a trustee in 
help you make that happen? Well, we have incredible leadership. We are truly, truly blessed. Um, I'm a big fan of Dr. Richard Rhodes, our chancellor. And I believe that in 2016, when I was elected as a trustee, thank you all very much, by the way, because without you, I wouldn't be here. We started around the pathways, the career pathways. And this is truly, I think, it's been talked about a lot across the years as I studied in the community college leadership program about the student-centered learning about really taking the person where they are and helping them through the various mechanisms and channels that the institution put in place to help a student succeed. And in 2016, with the Pathways, Austin Community College embarked on a really, as did other colleges around the nation, on a focused program of trying to figure out how to truly be student-centered. That included every single part of the institution, faculty, staff, everybody needed to be welcoming and it couldn't be a revolving door. It needed to be a place where people came in and we figured out what it took. And I, and I say we, and that includes the student, figure out what it is that needs to happen in order for the student to be successful. And we're still working it out. Nobody's got a solution for the whole thing, but I believe we've got, I thank Virginia Freire for putting so many things in place, putting together the model and the system that it took to really begin to implement these ideas. And now it's on the institution to truly implement them from the student services perspective. And from the faculty perspective, we need much more diversity in our institution. And I know for years that in, that diversity has not been there. And so it's gonna be a challenge to change that, but I do believe we are working on it. Um, and we have to keep our feet to the fire on that one for the institution and keep our, our focus on where is the diversity so that the students can see themselves. But more than anything, I believe the institution is being led uh, by people who believe that the student can make those choices given the information that they need and that they can learn. And through developmental studies, if you're not ready and you need to learn some basics, it's not learning all the basics. It's learning the basics that you need in order to make it to the next step. And so as an adult, we don't treat you like a child. We treat you like an adult who can pick up the information that you need in order to be successful in a career. And then the other doors will open for you and that's required. Thank you. The good part of your professional, I assume personal life, has been about creating connections, uh, both in your business world and in your uh, volunteer world. And you developed, as I mentioned before, um, uh, La Comadre para la Americas. And again, I apologize for my uh, transliteration skills. But, uh, and, and the tagline is connecting, and I think we have uh, your picture behind you is connecting Latinas everywhere. Can you talk a little bit about why you created it? What does it do? Um, and I know that I can't join because, not because I'm not Latinas, because I'm not a woman, but that's okay. So uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what it does and what it's about. Well, Las Camadas para las Americas ended up being a national and actually many people have asked for it to truly be international, but I don't write Spanish well, so that makes it really hard. And even my spoken Spanish is challenging. And, and so it's hard for me to make it the international organization that it can be and will be. I've got a great, um, follow up here coming soon. But basically, I missed my culture. And I was extremely concerned that my roots were slipping away. And I wasn't going to know who I was anymore. And that that really bothered me. At the University of Texas, when I went there, we were like 12% of the population in, in Austin. I didn't see Latinas every place. Or in, and in that case, I'm really speaking Mexican American. Okay, at that time, I am not talking Mexico, Mexico, Central America, South America. I was talking about the Mexican American culture that I grew up in. I didn't see it around here. I couldn't figure out where it was. Of course, I was focused on school 
and I had a set of twins that I was bringing up by myself. And so doing all of it at the same time was kind of hard to look outside of the university. But when I finished my PhD and I went to look out there, uh, just like I didn't see us at the University of Texas, I didn't see us in, in the community at large. In the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Greater Austin Hispanic, I'm sorry, the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce, there were very few Latinos there. There were very few Latinos in, in any of the boards, in any of the companies where I worked. I was very lonely. So I kept looking for, for others like me and for my roots. And so that was the reason that it, it wasn't just me. It was really other women in the in Austin and all over the country because actually there were many groups of commodities all over. They just weren't connected through technology. And really the only thing that I did was to take advantage of the technology and begin to bring all those groups together. And that was because I, I was able to, I, I knew the computer world. My husband um, was a computer person. And so he helped me set up all the systems and to connect people all over the country. But it was lonely. I wanted to be around other Latinas and I needed to find us and it wasn't easy. In, in my, thank you. In, in, in the last episode, I, I interviewed uh, James someone and I, at that point I, I made reference to a 2016 study uh, by the Center uh, for Talent Innovation, Latinos at Work Unleashing the Power of Culture, in which the study basically reports that most Latinas don't feel, Latinos, pardon me, don't feel that they can bring their whole selves to the office. And I'm picking up on the loneliness, sense of isolation um, and so forth that you just made reference to both at ACC or in college and elsewhere. Um, what's your thoughts on that challenge? What, what can non-Hispanics um, do to help foster a better environment so that people don't have to live in this cognitive dissonance that uh, the situation creates? You mentioned earlier when you and I were talking that uh, the challenge is not just the institutional challenge, but it goes way beyond the institution and really changes in society that necessary. So can you speak to that for, for a bit? Well, you know, I think in, in, in many places, corporate America and even at Austin Community College and other institutions, you create affinity groups so that you identify the people that are um, from your culture and you get to know each other and kind of work together to try to improve the positions and opportunities in the institution. But, and I think it needs to be both and, you need to have that, but also I think our institutions at large need to know and understand more about the diversity of our cultures. Who's here? Who isn't here? How do we bring them in? How, do, how are we inclusive? Because in the end, we are all human. And that's what we're talking about here. I need, I need to learn more about the, the and, and, you know, we're not monolithic. We are indeed from many different countries. What binds us largely is language and not necessarily because all of us don't speak Spanish today, but we still feel that affinity and many of our parents and grandparents are still speaking that particular language. So there's that connection, but really I think, and at ACC we've got Ascended, and now we also have an African-American program and we're working on an Asian program and, and others. And I think we, it, Native American, we, we need to give everybody a space for themselves, but then also bring the institution in. So the focus on diversity, inclusion, equity, all those things, they're a big part of getting to know each other and to really open the doors. And I really mean that sincerely because I don't necessarily see Latinos in uh, positions of power across our community. Um, even at ACC, there are issues around all of those things and we need to work on them together. They are not going to get fixed overnight. But what I do know is that it is necessary that we take those steps and that we keep them going and that we participate in them and we include others. And I believe, you know, you may need to force it or require it in the beginning, but I think after, it takes time, change takes time and, and we're impatient. You know, I want it today, 
I've always wanted it today, but if I can't get it, then what can I do today and tomorrow and the next day? And let's make sure that those steps are there, not just for the Latino community, because we have to work. Today is the time to bring everybody into this space. Absolutely. I understand that Black Lives Matter has a real focus and bless, bless that situation. But at the same time, this is the time to fix it for everyone. We need to open the doors and we need to figure it out. Absolutely. So knowing what you know today, and given who you are today, um, and given the fact that um, you're a role model to a lot of people, um, what would you say to the younger Nora back in, uh, back in Raymondville about what to expect in your life? You know, Barry, I didn't think about it much. And I think that's part of the problem. I think we need, I just did things and things were in my path and I took advantage of them. I was lucky. And I think luck ends up playing a big part in many of our lives, though we don't think about it. I was at the right place at the right time for a lot of the things that I did. And thinking back on them today, it's like, I wish that I had had more introspection, more time for reflection that either through the school or the church or your social groups or whatever, there was a more of a conversation about a future. You are, every day takes you closer to a future right? And so what are you going to do about it? What are your plans for it? We didn't talk about career. I took classes and maybe I learned here and there that I could be a biologist or a chemist or a physicist or a nurse or a homemaker because we used to have homemaking classes. I failed all of them and I still can't cook. And I preferred the, you know, the farm animals and all those other things, but I couldn't because I was a girl and the farm future farmers were over there and the future homemakers were over here. But we, we, we don't do that. And I think we need to start very, very early with our kids talking about a plan, thinking about it. It doesn't mean that the plan is set in concrete. You can change it tomorrow. That's what I love about living today, that there are so many opportunities, but you have to see them. You have to know about them. And so it becomes imperative that we start early talking to kids about that, talking about that and showing them role models. You know, there were no role models in the time that I was growing up. My parents were it. And bless, I'm so grateful for the role models that I had because because of them, I am here today. Well, that's powerful. So uh, let's open it up to the, thank you. Let's open it up to our audience if there are questions. Um, if not, I've got others, uh, but um, let's open it up. Kate, can you open it up? And if there are any questions in the chat or... Uh, we invite everybody to come on camera and uh, join in the live conversation. Um, we, have, we don't have a question just yet, but we do have a comment that they, someone really likes the point that you made that we need to keep steps. We need to take steps and keep them going. So that is making, that's resounding with the audience. And um, please feel free to unmute yourself and let's just join in the conversation. Oh, Daniela, did you did you have a question? Thank you. Hi, my name is Daniela de Urioste and I am also from the area in South Texas and from Quinto. And I, a lot of what you said resonated with me in terms of divisiveness within the Hispanic community. And I was just wondering if Las Palmadres has kind of evolved their work as a lot of the sentiments you've mentioned, including diversity, inclusion, wanting to understand others' cultures. Has the, the mission of Las Comadres evolved to kind of account for this uh, divisiveness within our community? Not, okay, Las Comadres, basically, and I didn't tell you what that is, we're there to support each other, right? To open doors for each other. I found that through the lucky life that I led, 
I had opportunities to be on many boards and to meet many people that others did not have an opportunity to meet. And so I wanted to open those doors. And I found that all the other Latinas in my community who had any success also wanted to do that. So that's another thing that brought us together. How do we help each other? And so it was very much tied to that. I do know that at one point, um, you know, like the Cubans get over here and the Argentines and the Mexicans and, the, you know, separation. And I saw the need for everybody to come together to appreciate each other and to be supportive of each other. And that is an ongoing challenge. Let's go Madres gets together once a month informally for potlucks, or we used to. And uh, we do it through Zoom now some. And then also we send a lot of emails about jobs and scholarships and things going on in the community. It was open to everybody. And I never said that information needed to stay within the Latino community. You can send it to whatever friends you want to send it to. It comes to me. And I send out, or used to come to me, now it comes to a lot of different people. And then it goes out into the community and people take advantage of it and you support each other. It is that we open more doors. The Latino community right now needs a tremendous amount of support getting into the community to be seen as people who can be in leadership roles and can be invited, elected, selected to be in those roles, to be the role models, because we have a huge community that needs to see us and to believe that they can succeed. So for that reason, I focus on the Latino community because we are the largest number. In Texas, we will be a, a largest number for a while. Um, the Asian community will overtake us in terms of numbers. You know, it's a natural process of things expected. But in the meantime, while you can, make the most of it and give us that opportunity. That's that's what I hope. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Somebody. <laughs> I mean, it, more than a question, it's like, um... I'm very thankful that to be present here and, and listen to Dr. Comstock. Uh, and I agree with her that um, there's some division between Latinos, but we have to remember that we're still an oppressed group. And, and we've been since long time ago uh, and officially in, in politics, we are demonized and misrepresented and uh, people are afraid of us and some people are afraid of us but i think that despite our differences and our backgrounds uh and the way we speak our language we are still an oppressed group and we need to be together in spanish is we say la unión hace la fuerza together we're stronger so i mean is this is not a com my my comment here is not confrontational is more about redemption and being together and working together. And um, I am a part of Ascender, uh, like uh, Dr. Comstock mentioned, and I, and I see that uh, we have a hun hundreds of volunteers working with no pay for students and they are, they have big hearts. And I still believe in, in humanity. I still believe that there's good people who are willing to help. And I think that we should, uh, volunteering is, is a great start to develop community. It's a great start to develop familia despite your background of ethnicity. And Latinos, we have so much history and so much culture and I'm so proud to share that with everybody. So I, I thank you, Dr. Comstock for your words and thank you for uh, supporting always Latinos. Muchísimas gracias. Encantada, comadre. Encantada. Blanca. Hello, comadre Blanca. Hola, comadre. Hi, everyone. My question to you, Nora, right now is, and just listening to you, it just gives me um, just such joy to, to know you. And I admire you and respect you so much because I know how hard you've worked and how hard you continue to work. What is your advice to, to us, maybe people who are in their 40s, 
and 50s, how do we connect to the younger generation? In these that, different times. You know, Blanca, and, and she knows how hard this work is because Blanca was one of the people who was a volunteer with me for a very, very long time. And um, it was her support that helped me start the Texas Public Policy and Civic Engagement Program to prepare candidates for public office. And she also helped me with the book club, getting our Comadres and Friends National Latino Book Club started. So Blanca, thank you for your service because Las Comadres was not built by me. Las Comadres was built by you. All I did was make sure that things stayed connected. Uh, I stood behind, I was the Wizard of Oz, you know, the, the person behind the curtain. Um, and the thing is, you can't stay at home. You have to get out in the community. Mm -hmm. The only way to make a difference is to be out there. And when I ask Comadres to volunteer to do something, it always hurts my soul when I don't get the volunteers that I need. And I have to get out there and start picking up the phone and calling because people say yes when I call them and ask them, right? But I don't wanna have to do that. There's you know 2000 Comadres on our list. Why do I have to call you? Reply the darn email that asks you for volunteers and get off the couch and go out there and support Paul Saldana and the Austin Latino Coalition and the, and the CRT and the voters drives and the Con Mi Madres and the Avances and the everything. What are you doing sitting at home? Nothing is gonna change unless you get up and go out there. Why am I at 75 years old running for Austin Community College? Why aren't you? You know, you're younger, you have more energy. Ask me to help you. I'm there to help you. You say, Comadre, I need to get this job done. Let's get the Comadres together and others because there's lots of people in this community who want to help. Austin is a very helping community. They want to help. They may not understand. They may not be able to dot all the I's and T's about diversity and inclusion, but you know what? They're interested. They care. And those that don't, you know, I think they're willing to learn. They're a little hard headed sometimes. They got bang their head against the wall. But we can't give up because being human requires that we learn those things and that we work with each other. It, it just requires you to be out there. You cannot stay at home. You have to get involved because change will not happen unless you make a change yourself and help others understand. Blanca? you got to get out. And I know you do. So I know you're involved. I invite her to many things and she participates in as many as she can. She also has a, a child. So, you know, what you can do, do it. Thank you. Other Thank questions? You. Well, let me ask you, Nora. Um, so your passion is evident and inspiring. Um, how do you deal with the frustration of being a leader? And sometimes, as you were saying, the followers aren't necessarily the best of followers. They need that personal attention from you rather than responding to the broadside or to the general call for action. How do you personally deal with that frustration and continue the same level of energy and passion that you do? Well, I think that I understand that people are very busy and they're being bombarded from so many different sides about so many wonderful things to do. And everybody needs your volunteer time. I say no to things as well, or sometimes I don't respond. So they must feel, and, and I, Forgive me, those of you, if I haven't responded to you, but it is important that we respond. So, you know, be able to say, I cannot do that today. Try me again. Okay, so thing number one, respond to each other. Let's be respectful of the request. If it's if it's individual, if it's just a general whatever, then, you know, you, you deal with it however you want to. But the, the frustration basically is that there is so much to do and that you have to figure out your path your challenge, what are the goals, your goals, what do you want to accomplish? And so given that I understand that, then I do have to kind of try to pick and choose how it is that I um, 
deal with those challenges. I don't think that it's people are lazy. I think there's just too much going on and you're not necessarily sure where to go, what to do. And today I haven't left my house since March pretty much. I mean, I, maybe I went one place or twice, but largely how do you do it? You know, it's through Zoom or phone calls. You know, some, of, some are not lucky enough to be able to stay at home. Their jobs require that they go out and do things and, and expose themselves to, to danger. Um, I don't have to do that, but I do it through Zoom and through um, phone calls. And I guess let's give each other grace, but let's push each other as well. Call your friends, call people, try to involve them the best you can and don't give up. That, I think the most important message of all of it is don't give up. Helpful advice. I have a comment that I'd like to share. Um, I'm Bobby Garza Hernandez, and I've known Nora for a lifetime. I think um, um, one of the one of the questions about connecting with the younger generation. Uh, I've spent the last 23 years um, doing community outreach and engagement for some of the high-profile projects in Austin, and what I have found is that there are a lot of misconceptions about older seasoned um, individuals and how you connect with the younger generation is one-on-one. -on -one. And more yes. and more because of that community outreach and engagement work that I do in some of the most disenfranchised communities in Austin, I'm finding that we're by doing that by by connecting on that level whether now it's by zoom or on the phone or um, back when we were meeting at meetings um, you began to tear down some of those perceptions that the younger generation have of those of us that are more seasoned um, just recently i have found um, a group of young women that just because of those conversations have begun to call me um, to ask questions, how do you handle this? Um, but they're understanding that there's also an, a, an enormous amount of wisdom and knowledge that comes with the, the gray hair or the silver hair. Uh, but on another note, my question um, to you, Nora, is, and, and I don't know if you've encountered this, um, in my 23 years of being in business for myself, and then um, even the years that I spent um, in, in Gus Garcia's office as his chief of staff, as a Latina, I was one Latina out of seven senior aides on the council. And I got more pushback from our male counterparts than I did from any other group. I'm saying um, in business, I have been given a hand up. Um, I've been supported by white males, um, black males, Asian males. But when it comes to our Hispanic or Latino males, I, what I have encountered in those 23 years is mostly an attempt to tear you down. I'm, my question is how do we begin to change that dynamic? Um, sitting down one-on-one -on -one with them does not change that dy dynamic for the most part. And yeah. I'm, I'm inclined to say it's a cultural issue, but as you know, cultural issues can be changed, <laughs> but I've not had any success in it. You know, Bobby, and I think the, the comment is, you know, sometimes the dinosaurs die, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's a new, um, a new crop, so to speak. And I think a lot of the younger um, males uh, in business and so on, I find them more open. And I think, again, it's cultural and it's kind of the way, even though, even though, our mothers were the entrepreneurs very often. Yes. They were, you know, they were out there hustling and doing things along with the dads. But mom was out there. Many of us as Latinas can talk about our mothers as our role models, mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs and everything else. 
And so that is there. And I think the machismo thing is still very much alive and we've got to we've got to continue to fight it and one of those ways is bringing in the young males who are who are much more open and also just getting together as latinas and supporting each other we also support the males you know that because we are you know we have sons right Mm -hmm. Uh, you need to support your son so you don't just support the women but you do want to bring women up and today in colleges we are finding that there are more women attending college than the latino males which is good and bad right because if it's my son I want him in college and so do you and you make sure that your son goes to college and you make sure you bring him up right you're the one who teaches that boy to value women to value our talent in our abilities as well as the males so you know it's on us and right now we still have to help the latina entrepreneur even though we know that in this country more businesses were being opened by women entrepreneurs, Latinas, than any other businesses. So the support is there. And I think what we're, we're seeing is kind of the residual of the past and change is happening. And so Bobby, let's hang in there. Mm-hmm. Nora, I just want to jump in quickly and let you know that we have some great comments um, in the chat box. And one is that one of our listeners has their eight-year-old daughter listening in as part of their homeschooling class, and she's so grateful to have yes. part of that. How wonderful. How wonderful. Well, I just, I want to encourage all of you to do what you can to get out, you know, to help with the schools, to, and many of you already do it, but let me just tell you how important it is. Without you, the change that needs to happen will not. Just think about that. It's on your shoulders to bring about the changes that need to happen. Don't just sit back. Don't let anybody tell you you're not good enough. Don't tell anybody because, you know, because you don't speak English that you can't have a daughter as president of the United States someday. Don't you let anybody tell you that because it will happen and it could be your daughter. Wow. Any other questions? While we're waiting, I, for, go ahead. I, oh, oh, sorry. I would, I would like to actually have two questions that I wrote down just kind of uh, hearing in on, you know, a little bit of what um, I got on a little bit late. So I apologize for that. Um, so my first question would be, so I work in uh, with United Way of Williamson County and I, um, this is my first year doing like the community investment grants through United Way. So my first question would be to, how can I go about participating and being in more organizations or more programs focused towards Latina and just other racial ethnic groups here in the Williamson County to promote them, to promote to them to come and apply for these grants that we're giving out to the community so that one, we can make that that difference here in the Williamson County area for the Latino and African-American population. Uh, That's my first question. My second question would be, how can we collaborate more cohesively with all races? And, you know, whether that's just, you know, African-American, Latino, um, Asian-American, you know, all races collaboratively to make sure that we're being seen on all platforms and not as a divided, um, you know, amongst race thing. How can we make it more cohesively? Because um, kind of going with what Blanca was saying, the new millennials want to do something that's gonna help everyone and not just one single race or one single look of person. So how can we make those more cohesively um, and make them better maybe partnerships so that we're all representing one another? Those are great questions. And thank you so much for asking that. And basically, um, I would be delighted to help you. Um, my, my address is nora.comstock at gmail.com. 
send me your information. And it's through connections, okay? So those of you who are here, who are part of Las Comadres, you'll receive the information that Desiree sends to me. And then we ask you to get in and give us your contacts, because that's how things work. You know, I only know so many people, but Bobby knows a whole different group of people. And then Blanca knows a whole different group of people. And that's how we share information across the networks and how we're able to help you do the job that you need to do about community outreach, because we have to help each other. Bobby asked me for help and I ask others for help. So that's part of the way we do it. Uh, and that's a way I believe we can help you. And the other thing, there was a program once upon a time that Les Comandes used to do about reaching out and having a cultural uh, evening where we met with the Indian community. And we went to a home of one of our Indian comadres and they brought in somebody from all of the states of India that talked to us about the various groups and how they were similar and how they were different. And we shared a meal and we learned about food and we learned about all those many things. And it was a beautiful evening. I got Hannah on my hand, you know, it was just such a beautiful thing to have done. And not only to have it, to see it on me, but to see how it was done. Well, wow, I mean, it was just a, a how the, their their version of tortillas are made right and how we shared that and we sat on the floor and we sang and we danced and we shared each other's culture so that was something and then we also did it within the latino culture like i don't know very much about Columbia, right? So we had Columbia night and people would come with show and tell and tell us about Columbia. And so we learned about that. So we need to do more of those things. And maybe you do it in your neighborhood. Maybe your, your neighborhood group, the center, encourages that type of multicultural uh, monthly, weekly, whatever it happens and use our parks. Let's have more park days where the different cultures are out there doing things and we get to learn about it. We're not taking advantage of what's available for us to be able to build community out of diversity because we are all human in the end we are all human and we connect to the humanity and we connect to those differences and and we have to do it the structure the the way to do it the parks the the homes the friends the the organizations they're there we just have to provide what we know needs to happen i ask you to do it at your connection base bobby to do it in hers me and mine each one of you, Daniela and hers, Marcia, how wonderful to see you, Marcia, sorry. Uh, Marcia in Spanish or Marcia in Spanish is Marcia. So I, I kind of lean in that direction. But actually each one of us has to take what's there and figure out how to use what's there to meet your goals. And you might want to ask us, you might want to say, Comadre, how would I make that happen? And I could give you my ideas. And so maybe we brainstorm. Maybe one of the things the Zoom call we do next is let's brainstorm all of you out there who want to connect. This is what I need to do. Who wants to brainstorm so that we can come together and you will excite me with your passion and with your mission because I know it needs to happen. So let's, let's ask each other for help. Let's build community through asking for help and support. Absolutely, thank you for that. You're welcome. I hope I answered both your questions. Nora, I think it's just a shame that you don't have any energy. <laughs> I know. Barry and I were talking earlier about the hand waving and I'm doing it all over the place over here. And, and one time I, had a cup in my hand, my own cup, right? And I hit it and went all over me. I mean, you know, there are many disadvantages to hand waving. <laughs> all right, any, any other uh, questions? So, uh, Nora, um, this has been a delight. You're always delightful, even virtually. Uh, <laughs> and uh, your passion, your, your wisdom um, are very much appreciated and we can see that from the lively questions people have asked and their engagement. And thank you very, very much. And I think that we at ACC are very fortunate that you ran for, were elected and stay a trustee of the college. 
I think your influence is very, very important. Well, thank so, you. I thank you. And I'm here. Anybody wants to, to email me and ask questions or participate in whatever, please feel free to do that. I'm, I'd be delighted to help in any way that I can. Barry, I am honored, really honored to have been asked to spend time with you and all of our friends. Come on, Thank just. You. I think you've added members to the Nora Comstock uh, fan club uh, from you. the viewers. So I, I want to thank you all for watching and participating in civil society. And I especially want to thank Kate Tolliver, our managing producer for her support uh, in making all of this possible. You can read more about Nora and the issues we just discussed uh, and view previous and future episodes of Civil Society at nonprofitaustin.org. Uh, we have these episodes uh, every week, Thursdays at 10 o'clock. Uh, please feel free to sign up. Um, We'd love to have you all back as guests, as participants and guests uh, in the future. With that, I wish you all a safe uh, and good day. And thank you very much for participating.